a minute of silence in towns and cities across the United Kingdom and then the singing of the Ukrainian national anthem at number 10 Downing Street, the home, of course, of the British Prime Minister. On this one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine's President Zelensky welcomed a vote at the United Nations calling for the immediate, unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukrainian territory. Now, that resolution was backed by an overwhelming majority of countries, which President Zelensky described as a powerful signal of global support. These pictures are from Kyiv just a very short time ago. President Zelensky took part in a ceremony honoring Ukrainian soldiers and families. Similar ceremonies are taking place in cities and towns across Ukraine, including Bucha, where Vladimir Putin's forces were accused of committing crimes against humanity. We can hear from President Zelensky speaking to the Ukrainian people exactly 12 months after Russia's full-scale assault began. Great nation of Ukraine. A year ago, on this day, from this same place around 7 in the morning, I addressed you with a brief statement lasting only 67 seconds. We will defeat all threats, shelling, bombs, missiles, kamikaze drones, blackouts, colds. We are stronger than all of this. It was a year of endurance, a year of compassion, a year of bravery, a year of pain, a year of hope, a year of perseverance, a year of unity, a year of invincibility, a fierce year of invincibility. Its main conclusion is that we have survived, we have not been defeated and we will do everything to win this year. President Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, well, I'm joined now from Kyiv by our international editor, Jeremy Bowen. Jeremy, I guess it says a lot that President Zelensky was able to uh, go into the open air in the center of Kyiv and uh, be part of a, of a major parade on this one year anniversary day. It says a lot about Ukrainian resistance, but I guess there's also an intense awareness today of the immense cost of this year of war to Ukraine. Yeah, the uh, Ukrainians don't like to talk about their casualty figures, but they are very high in the tens of thousands dead, most likely. Uh, the atmosphere in the city is very different to how it was in the first few weeks of the war, when the, the Russians were close by and they thought they might be breaking into the place. In March, they defeated them on the edge of Kiev and uh, they were able then to eventually resume something that looks a little bit like normal life. The shops are open and that kind of thing. And uh, while I've been, been been here in the last couple of weeks, actually, I've been trying to catch up with some of the people who I got to know in the course of uh, a year of reporting from here off and on. And among them are two uh, young recruits, um, Maxim and Dimitro, who I, I met when they were signing up. And uh, they've been involved in a lot of active service ever since. And uh, I asked them, because they were looking very brave on that morning, they were only respectively 18 and 19 years old, and I said, you know, how did you really feel? A lot of fear, I'm not going to lie, because uh, I haven't uh, experienced anything like that before. We had uh, some stupid brave, braveness, bravery, bravery, bravery. Uh, and uh, it helped us to overcome our fear. Yeah, Jeremy, two young men who you've been following for the past year. I, I, I guess year one has been about Ukraine's ability to resist. Incredible defiance from Ukrainians in the face of Russian aggression. But inevitably, they're also going to be thinking about what year two will bring. And today, President Zelensky was talking about Ukrainian in invincibility and his determination to see this coming year as a year of victory. Do you think that Ukrainians really believe that is possible? I think they believe they can win. I think that even if you talk to senior officers, as I've done, they are a little bit doubtful about whether they can do that in the absence of the kind of decisive war-winning weapons that they want. And of course, top of Zelensky's shopping list now that he's got 
tanks coming anyway, slowly but coming, uh, is a modern air force and also long-range artillery. Now, that is something that even if NATO had agreed to send it, which they have not, uh, would not be uh, installable easily overnight or even in the course of a couple of months. My feeling is that both Ukraine and Russia are now stuck in this absolutely vicious and bloody war of attrition, mostly in the east, down in the south as well. And so around here in Kyiv, people are going, I just went for a long walk around the town, centre of the town, and lots of people around, shops open and that sort of thing. I spent a lot of time in the east. It is very, very different over there. And I think that at the moment, both sides are, if you like, presiding over this terrible mincing machine, and neither of them have the wherewithal to push forward to victory. And interestingly, in his State of the Union address the other day, President Putin in Moscow echoed really what Zelensky is saying about Ukrainian in invincibility, only for him, of course, it's Russian invincibility. And he said, Russia cannot lose on the battlefield, signaling that he's going to stick it out. Jeremy, it is great to talk to you. Thank you very much. And of course, we will hear much more from Jeremy through the course of the day. Our correspondent James Waterhouse now reports also from Kyiv, one year on from that Russian full-scale invasion. A thud marking the moment when Ukraine and the world uh, changed forever. Bigger land grab. We've just heard a siren go off for the first time. We haven't heard that before. After months of build up, 150,000 Russian soldiers crossed the border. Millions headed the other way. A country under attack, with its people caught in the middle. Where Russia retreated, horrors were revealed. Ukraine's president became a wartime leader. His video addresses now a nightly ritual. Moscow is still framing this as a defensive war. Today, once again, we are in grave danger. Using Ukraine, the collective West is seeking to dismember Russia, to deprive it of its independence. These attempts are doomed to fail. The United Nations has voted to demand Russia stops its invasion. Today, the UK is going to urge countries to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. For now, in the West, there is broad unity. But that could change the longer this war goes on. Ukraine has reclaimed some of what was taken, like here in Kherson. Complete liberation is a long way off. James Waterhouse, BBC News, Kyiv. The war, of course, goes on. Our international correspondent, Orla Gerin, is on the ground in Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine, where the fighting is at its fiercest. Let's hear from her now. Behind me there is, or, or was, a multi-storey apartment block. This location was hit overnight on the 1st of February by a ballistic missile, an Iskander missile, and four residents were killed here. We've been speaking this morning to some of the people who used to live in this apartment block, who told us about how their lives have been torn apart. One elderly woman was in tears. She said she had lived here for 60 years. She herself was injured but rescued uh, by the emergency services here. But you can look at this behind me and you can repeat this not just across the east of Ukraine, which is very heavily contested, but also in Kyiv, also in cities in the south. We have seen this pattern across the country in this year of Russia's war, where many, many of the targets have been civilian targets. There is wide-scale destruction. There are cities and towns that are either deserted or in ruins. And here we are a year on with no indication of when this war might finish. And also the cold, hard reality here is that Russia still controls almost 20% of Ukraine, despite a year of very hard fighting by Ukrainian forces with the support of Western allies. 
All uh, go in there in Kramatorsk. It's important to remember that when Russia launched that full-scale invasion a year ago, most people expected an uneven battle, a quick Russian victory. But it hasn't turned out that way. Paul Adams was in Kyiv when the war started. He looks now at the cost of the conflict. It's not easy to get your head around the sheer scale of what's happened in Ukraine over the past 12 months. This is the biggest conflict in Europe since the Second World War. The UN reckons that at least 8,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed, over 13,000 injured, and those are just the figures we know about. More than 13 million people are homeless. 8 million are now refugees in Europe. Millions more are still in the country, but not in their homes. The UN believes 21 million people, more than half of the country's pre-war population, need help. Large parts of eastern and southern Ukraine lie in ruins. More than a thousand educational buildings have been attacked. And more than 750 healthcare facilities. Theatres, libraries and religious buildings have also been targeted. <laughs> Russia's attack was fast. Within days of invading, its forces were at the gates of the capital, Kyiv. Huge chunks of the east and the south were in Russian hands. But Ukraine fought back, forcing the Kremlin to abandon its attempt to take the capital. And pushing Russian forces back, first in the northeast and then in the south, where the city of Kherson was liberated. The cost in soldiers' lives has been immense. Ukraine is thought to have lost as many as 100,000 dead or wounded. For Russia, it's been much worse. As many as 200,000 casualties, with a much higher proportion of those killed. The West has sprung to Ukraine's defence in one of the most remarkable efforts of its kind ever seen. From anti-tank weapons that began to flood in early on, to sophisticated artillery systems that allowed Ukraine to go on the offensive, and tanks and armoured vehicles that are even now on their way. Ukraine's allies have so far promised more than $65 billion of military aid. The United States has been by far the biggest donor. None of this, of course, has brought the war to an end. Most people agree that it's likely to go on for a lot longer, killing even more people and swallowing up vast resources. With no peace process in sight, the cost of this terrible war can only rise.